Okay. <laughs> it does work. I have so many fewer thumbnails on Zoom that are crazy because we're all smiling instead of, <laughs> instead of not smiling. All right, you guys, we're here on the risk taking week. So I hope it made you uncomfortable. I hope that you were challenged by it. And I hope that you were also encouraged at the goodness of God, that there is nothing he asks us to do that he himself hasn't gone before us into, right? Like every command of God always contains within it the actual power we need to obey, which is why we can do whatever he says. So let's pray, shall we? Close your eyes. Roll your shoulders just a bit. Collapse them away from your ears and go ahead and lift your chin, deep in your breath. Oh. What can you leave here at the altar before we dive in? Is there anything that's distracting your heart or weighing on your heart? Lord, we bring it all to you. We lift our gaze to you, the one who is preeminent. That you are the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. Thank you that you are to be feared, that you are the great God over and above all. Jesus, thank you that you are the firstborn from the dead, that you have redeemed us back to the Father by your blood that you at the cross purchased us and sealed us then with the Holy Spirit upon your resurrection. So we once again come here and tell you we love you. Lord, the doing of things, the risk-taking, the serving, all of those things are actually not the point. And so we recalibrate to the fact that, Lord, you are the point and we're so delighted. <laughs> So we lift our gaze up to you, King Jesus, that you're magnificent and beautiful and holy and good and righteous and ferociously beautiful. God, would you show us your glory? Father, may we be men and women who've been very literally captivated by who you are. So that then as we go into the world, we with open face would shine your glory, your light. So that every path we follow you on, regardless of the magnitude of the risk, we would follow with joy because we know you never leave us, nor forsake us, and you never lead us into a place that will not turn out for your namesake. <laughs> You're good. We honor you. Just take this couple of quick breaths and thank him for something or someone. So, Father, we love you back. Holy Spirit, come and teach us. Lead us that we would be bold and kind, courageous and wise. In your beautiful name, Jesus, we pray. <laughs> Isn't he so beautiful? Oh, my gosh. We could just talk to him. And then it, you, it would be better. But we get to talk about risk taking, too. So that's good. All right. John 12, 25. Jesus. Red letters. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And so we're pressing into the secret place following that leads to Christ-like leading. It's fascinating to me how the Lord is doing a shifting and a sifting in the bride and 
that's part of why you're here, right? He will have his bride ready. It's guaranteed. Romans, not Romans, Revelation 19 says the bride has made herself ready. And so we get to be a part of that both personally and as leaders in the kingdom. We have this beautiful invitation to follow, to lean deeper, and to enjoy him as under shepherds of the great shepherd, right? Like what an incredible honor. And I pray if you do not yet have a sense of holy fear over the fact that he has called you to leading in the kingdom, that you develop one, that he grants you that holy reverence and awe that you get to partner with him in under shepherding in this beautiful world. All right, I want to... Revisit this. Re just for a quick moment. Let me hide. Can you guys? You don't see my buttons now. Somebody off, come off mute if you see all the buttons and not the pillars. But so this is where we've been, right? So we started out with vision, mission, and core values. Which, if you're still working on it, I would love to hear more about that because it's beautiful to see how he works it out over time. That we are. Our why and our how, remember it's partnership with God, not performance. It's sufficiency of Christ, not enoughness. It's utter dependence on him by the power of the spirit. And then it's availability. Again, so much of our lives is simply the willingness to say, here I am, I'm available. And then we went God first, God only, that he is our first and only he's preeminent. He is the point, right? And we come up under him in such a beautiful invitation to intimacy. And then our identity anchored into who he is because of who's like who we are is dependent on whose we are. So he has already determined and said your value that you are created in the image of God. He knit you together. He deposited in you the gifts, the weaknesses for his glory that you might put off the old and put on the new loving others, learning that we must first receive, right? And leaders are not always the best at receiving because they're driven oftentimes to go and to give. And sometimes the drive is actually from the people who want to continually draw more. And so we become people who first sit in the secret place and let him love us. Remember the lover circle it begins with, he loves us. We receive his love and then we go and love others. So what is your practice of receiving the love of God? Service. That service also begins with a receiving in the humility that we have nothing apart from him, that all is gift, and that there is nothing we have that we have not received. And so we serve out of that overflow as bond slaves of the Lord and living unto him in such a way that whether we're cleaning toilets or working in the Fortune 500, whatever that thing is called, I think I mixed some names together, but you get what I'm saying. All of it is unto the Lord. And then the people get the benefit of this presence, intimacy kind of living. And then here we are at risk takers. And well, you can see what's coming next. Freedom, joy, and life speaking as we close in the next three weeks. And so this topic of risk taking, it's so exciting. It's so because it's so uncomfortable and it's so rewarding, right? Right, like there's no reward eternally of sitting on your couch out of fear, right? There's really not, there's no reward now. Like it's just boring, but don't we get caught in fear and these things that want to keep us from walking out and obeying the Lord. And so I wanna show you a video that in my mind pretty much encapsulates just about every part of risk taking in the kingdom. Okay, let me know if you can hear the sound. I'm gonna turn it up so if it's too loud, I apologize. All right, do you see that? Hold on, I gotta back that because it's muted. Okay. Impossible. Nobody can jump this. He said impossible. 
Listen. Okay. This is what I tell my kids. Give me your eyes. I need your eyes. <laughs> Sometimes this is how things feel that God has called us to. Impossible, right? Like it feels impossible. And so we face those things and we look at it and then we keep going. Here we go. And you must hurry. Come quickly. It's a leap of faith. <laughs> okay, I have to stop it right there because I love that like, oh, are you kidding? Because I don't know about you, but I have very much felt those exact, oh, it's a leap of faith. Oh, let's see what happens. You must believe, boy. You must believe. Okay. He's like, okay, okay. Oh, I'm going to die, but I'm going to at least try. I love that. Oh. I didn't die. I didn't fall. And then look, watch, watch, watch. Never notice a path disappears. But not until after he took that first step. I feel like this clip from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is so prophetic as to the seasons in our life where God invites us to large risks right? There are every day, there's a risk you're invited to. It might be to pray for your neighbor. It might be, I don't even know. It might be to go to the grocery store and actually pay attention to the people there. And then maybe he gives you a word for them, or maybe you just lead with your face smiling, right? There are, there are daily risks. There's the risk of, I am not going to say what I wanted to say when I know I'm right, but I know it's wrong. <laughs> Anybody? So there are daily, these daily intimate places of obedience. And then there are these big things and it all requires surrender and trust. Do you trust your father? Do you trust his nature? Do you trust that when he invites you to do something that he will not let you fall? <clears throat> will you develop this foundation of dependence on him that says, I know you're good. I will dream big and I will obey you. All risk taking in is, is in the kingdom is actually following well. It is following the one who says, take up your cross and follow me. It's wild. So all the other pillars have brought us really to this place where we now do it. I love this quote from John Wayne. He says, courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. <laughs> I And this is from Wild at Heart, which I think is John Eldridge. Says, Every Christian's life is marked by windows of opportunity that demand a radical step of faith in order to follow Christ and to fulfill his agenda for their life. Here's the thing. This is really sobering to me. God has a will and a desire for your life. That does not guarantee it will come about. It doesn't, because if we do not obey and participate and follow, we will miss the desires and the dreams of God over our lives. And so we develop this pattern, this lifestyle of following well, so that we then are worth following. <laughs> do you, um, do you, do you have a what if kind of friend, like a person that you're like, oh, what, what if? Like any, somebody in your life was like, but what if this happens? But what if that happens? Maybe you're that person. Like maybe you, your tendency that the Lord is delivering you from is, but what if, what if I do that and this happens? What if I start teaching classes and nobody comes? What if I coach or what if I share the gospel and nobody listens? So I'm going to invite you to foster a different kind of what if and to be this person to others. But what if you started doing classes? And only one person came, but they got radically saved and freed. What if you started coaching and you saw a generation of change happen because of your obedience? What if 
you begin to watch for people and share the joy of Jesus. And what if your neighborhood experienced revival? You, you can go one way or the other. Why do you think the command fear not or do not fear is the most one? It's the most used in the Bible. It's because the enemy loves to use fear. It's, it's almost as if our flesh is naturally fearful, right? But your spirit, it's not. Your spirit is like, yeah, baby, let's go. I'm in Jesus. So it's putting off and putting on, putting off and putting on in this lifestyle of developing habits of risk from intimacy. Here's the thing. You practice being with him. You be with him. You hear his voice. You receive his affection and his service and return it back. And then you go out. Okay, on your mind today. Jesus, what are you praying? What are you doing in my family? What are you doing in my world? Lord, what are you What are you doing? What are you saying? Because when your activity comes from identity, there's freedom and you can step into the what ifs with peace. What's fascinating to me is that we often see big things and like, wow, I could never do that. But people who do big risks start out small. Right? Like, okay, let's use David and Goliath as an example. Killing a nine foot giant who is literally terrifying an entire army, telling them that they are going to die, that they're pigs, and all the terrible things that Goliath said to them. And he's a shepherd boy. Why? Why did David have the confidence to literally listen? He wasn't just risking his life, he was risking the entire country of Israel, the entire country. Why? Why could he do that? Because he'd put in the time in this secret place. He had killed a bear. He had killed a lion. He knew his God. And that's why David could say, how dare you, you uncircumcised Philistines, speak to the people that belong to the living God. You will die today. And it wasn't because he all of a sudden was ready. It was because he spent years knowing his God and fighting his battles and step by step. God isn't going to put you on a world stage tomorrow, but he might give you an opportunity tomorrow to obey him, to speak up, to fight the enemy that then begins to lay a foundation. It builds your strength. It builds your character. It builds your dependence and your trust so that out of that intimate personal experience flows public action. This is why we're going to see more and more of the celebrity Christianity just fall aside. Because what he's looking for is daughters and sons like you see on your screen who love him and know him and who are willing to go out into the world and be Jesus. Okay, four things. Number one, Michelle, would you type in the chat if you're able, the verses? Number one, we are called to the impossible. Let's just settle that today. Remember how Jesus in John 5, 19 said, I do nothing apart from what I hear the father telling me to do. So everything he did out of dependence, John 15, abide in me, apart from me, you can do nothing. Here's the thing. If you can do it, beware. If you can do your dream without him, beware. The point is not you accomplishing something. The point is partnership with him in the earth to bring his kingdom down. And that's nothing we can do on our own. And so we're called to this place of impossibility. That's why I love Mary's response when she said, how can this be? I'm a virgin. Like that's literally impossible, right? She asked a really great question. <laughs> And he, what did the angel say? He says, for nothing is impossible with God. Jesus said it again in Matthew 19, 26, where they're asking him, where he said something about the rich and how difficult it is for the rich to be saved. And then he says, but with God, nothing is impossible. And so we are called to be people who steward the supernatural into the natural. In Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2, it tells us that Jesus right now is seated at the right hand of the Father. That is a place of authority and utter victory. He has won the war. We are seated in Christ in heavenly places right now. 
That is our spiritual reality that you have the authority of a son or daughter of the king. And all of this life is retraining here to think like a kingdom citizen and bring heaven down. That's why Jesus said, pray like this. Father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right here in my now, in my in this earth and in this earth, have your way. Colossians 3.1 says, seek the things that are above and set your mind on the things where, of, that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So we're shifting our mindset from natural to supernatural. That's why it's impossible. And that's why it's good news. Because I don't know about you, but nobody needs more of me, right? Like they don't need more of me. They need him. They need the touch of the spirit that can do in a one second what 10,000 hours of Zoom with me would never accomplish, right? This is the beauty of the impossibility that we're invited to. Now, John 14, I love these words of Jesus. They're one of my most favorites. I encourage you to put them on a sticky note or a three by five card and memorize them. I'm gonna read them to you right now. Jesus says this, okay, and he says it with these two things first. He says, truly, truly. I always feel like he's like, I need your attention. When he says, truly, truly. Other translations say, verily, verily. And I always feel like he's like, lift up your chin and let me let me have your eyes let me have your eyes because this is really important truly truly i say to you listen to this whoever believes in me are you a whoever are you a whoever who believes in him i would hope so i believe that's why you're here it was not a trick question whoever believes in me listen to this will also do the works that i do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Every bit of religious lack of experience and unanswered prayer just came against those lines of truth that Jesus said. Well, that hasn't been my experience. It doesn't matter what our experience is. What matters is that he said, if we believe, this is what would happen. And so we, we begin to be people who say, God, you've called me to the impossible. So I'm going to pray like that dad did, who said, I believe, help my unbelief. God, deliver my soul from unbelief, where I've allowed my experience to determine truth over what your word says. You said, this is red letters. It's not somebody saying, this is what God, this is God himself saying, if you believe in me, you'll do the works that I do. What did he do? He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cleansed the leper. He cast out demons. He preached the gospel. He proclaimed the good news. This is the business of the kingdom and we are invited to it. And I pray that you press against everything that just was like, no, it's not for me. Because if you're whoever who believes, let your faith begin to stir for that. This is why discipleship is being with him, becoming like him and doing what he did. Because that is what makes him known in the world. That's what exalts him. That's why the Holy Spirit came. Why did he say in verse 13, he's, or he says, because I'm going to the Father. Because now Holy Spirit is here. <laughs> because now he lives inside of you. And that is amazing, right? Like if we really grasped, we would probably like burst. If we really understood what it means to have the God of all gods, the one who holds the universe, living inside of us. This is amazing. There's nothing that is impossible with God. He didn't say, except that one thing. He said, there's nothing. And if you believe you're going to do what I do and did, and then more. I think about things like Peter's shadow healing people. That's crazy, y'all. What about handkerchiefs that had touched Paul? That's wild. Why are we satisfied? Why are we satisfied? There is literally nothing in here that said, okay, we're done. Why do you think the book of Acts has no conclusion? Because it's supposed to be, we're still in it. We're supposed to be writing it ourselves. We are the acts now in our days today to see the King glorified, never for show, never for show, but signs and wonders and the power of God are to display his glory and his majesty. And they are a dinner bell because I don't know if you've noticed, but there is a fascination in our world with the occult, with new age, with witchcraft, with the demonic. 
And you know what the answer is, is us filled with the spirit and going in boldness because they need to see how magnificent he is and that there is no power that stands against the name of Jesus, that there is nothing that compares to the wild power and goodness of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we start with, we're called to the impossible. Shoot, we could just stop right there, Lord. Lord, would you teach us? God, would you forgive us for putting you in a box? Lord, would you forgive us for having such a small understanding of what you desire to do, God? Y'all, we are on, I believe that in this time, we are going to see a move of God in the earth. And I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be left behind because I'm distracted or I have small thinking about what he's able to do. Let's run, let's run. We are stewards of the mysteries and the mercies of God. Each one of us, where he has deposited us. So let's press in. Let's push back against everything that says, well, that's not for today. If it's not for, to for today, then I quit. I just quit and I'm gonna sit on my couch and eat bonbons. Because that is not what I signed up for. <laughs> Number two, we're going to give an account for our lives. Remember when we talked about our gifts and our callings in Matthew 25, how Jesus is going to, to ask an account of our lives one day when we stand before him. Second Corinthians 5.10, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. The verse before that says, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for our lives. And so Risk taking in part is birthed out of this holy fear that one day I will answer to him for what I've done with this one precious life. Not in shame or fear, but this awe of God, you've given me a life. I want to be faithful with it. I don't know about you, but I want to skid into the end of my life, having literally left everything on the table where it says, shoot, and you're coming in empty. When I was in Nepal, I was in Nepal for two summers in a row. And one summer we asked one, our translator to write down in um, the Nepali language, the words die empty. Their languages are so beautiful because their lettering is just lovely. And then we all got henna tattoos with it, totally an aside. But that point, the point is die empty, right? Like let's, it's kind of like a coach that says, leave it all on the field. That's my prayer for you, that we would become people again, not out of striving and not just running without rhythms of good rest, but with this heart posture that says, I am going to run my race because at the end of it is my Jesus. And he is cheering me on. And as I roll up in my sweat and fall at his feet, he will say, well, and there's really nothing else. In Judges 5, this is something, if you've come through instructor training at all, Elisa shares this, and I think it really fits well with this question and this discussion of risk-taking. In Judges 5, it says this, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of jail, the highways were abandoned and travelers kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose, I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. Here's the thing, don't quit. Your obedience makes eternal waves. There are people who cannot and will not arise until you do. That is both wildly amazing and so sobering, right? And so we anchor ourselves to God, you've called us to the impossible which is why we have Holy Spirit. And then this sober reality of, I will give an account for my life. In Psalm 90, 12, it says, teach us to number our days aright that we might gain a heart of wisdom, right? Like this is why Paul and I think Peter both talk about use your time wisely, right? Like we don't know we're guaranteed tomorrow. The world could explode tomorrow and we'd all be with Jesus, <laughs> which is good news for us and bad news for those who don't know him. So Lord, teach us in this day that we have to number our days aright. The third thing is having developing an eternal mindset and that 
seated with Christ in heavenly places mindset. Go ahead and if you want, you can turn to Hebrews. I love Hebrews. Hebrews is a wild book. Hebrews is so, man, there's so much. It's Hebrews is way smarter than me. <laughs> All right. Hebrews 10, we're going to start. Um, okay, we're going to start on 35. Hebrews 10, 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. I think it's important to say that sometimes the risk is simply enduring and not giving up. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. My soul has no pleasure in him, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are of those who have faith and preserve their souls. I want, I'm going to, I want to say, I want you to say this with me. I love him too much to shrink back. Okay. Now say it out loud. Like you mean it. I love him too much to shrink back. We are not those who shrink back, but we are those who have faith and preserve their souls. If you tend to fear and to shrinking back, I want you to write this down and memorize it and speak it over yourself. I am not the one who shrinks back, but I am the one who has faith and I preserve my soul. God, I thank you that I love you too much to shrink back. Michelle Tupin said that to me probably two years ago in the fall, we were, I was wrestling over something and she said, you love him too much to shrink back. And it has literally marked my life because I do. I do love him too much to shrink back. And so do you. And so do you. So then we see this goes into the hall of faith. I love Hebrews 11 because we see, you know, by faith is listed. I think it's 19 times. It's the phrase by faith or of faith or through faith in this short little chapter. And we see people like Abel. And we see Enoch and we see Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Jacob. We see Abraham and Isaac. We see J Joseph. We see Moses. We see the people of Israel. And it's all by faith. And then he goes on to talk about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets. So this is fascinating to me. And I think it's so kind of the Lord because there are people in the by faith list that if I were writing it, I would not have put it there. I would never put Samson in a list of the hall of faithers, right? If you read the stories, go to Judges, read about Samson. He seems more like um, not a hero of faith. But I love that also, like, it says by faith, Sarah received power. But what we see in the narrative is that she had laughter with tears in it when they said she would have a baby. They, we, it doesn't recount David's errors. It doesn't recount Abraham lying about his wife twice. It doesn't recount the errors. What it recounts is faith. And that is also really good news because that means what's being written in heaven of your life is the by faith. It's not the, oh, well, you screwed up again. It's the by faith, Christine, by faith, Audra, by faith, Paul. This is the story of our life that we're writing out by why do you think in every letter Paul ever wrote, he talks about by grace through faith alone? <laughs> because it's by faith. I love, I would love it if in your Bible you would write verse 41 and put by faith in your name. By faith. And then write your name and put a little ellipsis, those three dots. Because again, he is still writing all of this. In, he, in verse 13, it says, they lived their lives on earth as those who belonged to another realm. Isn't that delightful? By faith, we live here as we belong to another realm by faith. So we don't shrink back. We set our minds on things. Ever. And then the last thing is we know and then we do. We be and we act. Identity and then action. Hold on. I want to read you a verse. It's such a fabulous verse. In Daniel, don't you love God's word? Isn't it amazing? Oh my gosh, it's so fabulous. Okay, Daniel 11, 30 
too. It's so fun. It says this. This is the second half. He's talking about, well, I don't know. Again, these these end these what are they called? Apocalyptic readings. I don't ever pretend to understand them, but I think they're really cool and I'm glad God is God. Verse 11, chapter 11, 32, the second half, it says, the people who know their God will stand firm and take action. The King James Version says, those who know their God will be mighty and do it. So all of this comes back to knowing him and being known by him. It comes back to intimacy where you know his voice and you know his heart, not as an agenda to go out and do things, but because he's so glorious and delightful and worthy of all our praise. And then we do go and do mighty exploits, which I think is so fun. In Psalm 60, hold on, let me get there. Verse 12, it says, hold on, this is not the right chapter. With God, we will do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our enemies. And so out of the calling to the impossible, believing, giving an account for our lives, developing this by faith, eternal mindset, then from intimacy, we go and we do. I'm thinking about the risks of my life today. And I always thought I was not a risk taker. And then when I was 11, my parents decided that they would sell everything and we would move to Guatemala. My dad was like, I'm going to be a missionary to Guatemala. And I guess he heard about a guy who went down there one time and they needed an English teacher in Guatemala City, Guatemala. And so they sold everything except our house. The house would not sell. Thank the Lord. That's a longer story. But And we took three, three suitcases and a dog and we flew to Guatemala. And we lived there for a year. We didn't have a house. They didn't, I mean, I was 11 at the time. They didn't monthly itinerate. They literally went by faith. And a little bit of stupidity is what my mom says. And I think about how, like, God always sustained us. They he took care of us. Our dog did get eaten. Like, she ran away and got eaten. So that was kind of sad. But the rest of the time was pretty amazing. And I think about how that taught me that he's worth it all. Right? He's worth it all. When I had gone to college in Arizona for two years. I felt the Lord stirring my heart. And I went to India one summer, Regina with Teen Mania. And I was there and a bunch of the leaders went to Oral Roberts University in Oklahoma. And I called my parents from India and said, don't send the payment to Arizona State University. I don't think I'm supposed to go there. And I went to, didn't know anybody, went to Oklahoma of all places all by myself. And it, the first six months when I knew no one were the most intensive, deepest, sweetest times in my life where the Lord undid a lot of the hurt of my childhood when I had been sexually abused and there was a lot of shame and like he undid all of that, but it was a risk, right? Like literally I went from 80 degrees in Arizona in January, maybe 70, to an ice storm in Oklahoma. And then I was thinking about how when Chuck and I got married, we risked coffee shop. And again, with my parents, I'll tell you that story when we get to joy. And then I was thinking, I'm standing literally in a risk because we moved from Nebraska, no, from Arizona to Nebraska six years ago on a risk. We were invited um, by a couple to come and help build out their business. And it totally didn't work out at all like we'd hoped. Chuck was supposed to come into this business and help and really long story short, was never actually allowed to. And so they had to let him go. So 15, 16 months into moving our entire life to another state that we'd never even been to before, everything fell apart. And we're like, God, we know we were following you. Why isn't this turning out the way it's supposed to? So let me ask you that question. What do you do when risks of faith don't turn out the way you think they should? Like, it's a really, really important question that we settle before the Lord, because there are times when things don't turn out, right? Now, I will tell you, we don't regret leaving Arizona. It was 115 on Saturday. That's just, that's not all why. But, but it does 
invite us to a deeper space of trust when things don't turn out the way we think. Yeah. Because we follow and trust him with the results. Now here's the thing, and then we're almost ready for breakout, breakthrough rooms, is he is the greatest reward of risk as you get more of him. And when things don't turn out the way you hope, will you trust him? You know, our hearts can get offended with God and then that creates distance, creates distrust. An enemy loves to feed that. That's how he started in the garden. You know, he's keeping that from you, right? Like, and so we have to be people who really truly develop that, God, even if I'm gonna trust you, even when I'm gonna trust you because I know you're good and I know you're faithful and you said, in your word that you are working all things, right? There's a, Chuck actually did a family call way back in April of 22 on exactly the subject because life doesn't always turn out the way we hope. And so in that we risk trusting our good father because he sees much farther and much more clearly. I still have days when I'm like, I live in Nebraska. That's really weird, Lord. <laughs> you know, but we have found contentment here. Now we are going to move to Wyoming next year, which is super exciting, but that's a whole nother thing. Okay. All right. So in your breakthrough rooms, uh, it's going to be really great. Wendy Belinda's group, you actually are going to join Wendy Pollock's group tonight because Wendy Belinda is having a really delightful um, what is it called? What is she, she's doing something delightful. Well, hold on, let me hit pause because record. Hi, I'm glad you're back. What did the Lord teach you this week? <laughs> Excuse me. Lori, you're unmuted. Does that mean you want to talk? Oh, maybe you should anyways. <laughs> I will just share. Oh, wait, did I mute? <clears throat> I used to say, like, when God asked me to take a risk, if my mom would say, that's crazy, that's how I knew it was from God. <laughs> which I love my mom she's great but yeah like I'd be like oh it is God because she's saying it doesn't make sense <laughs> that's fantastic <laughs> so I think we all want in our Christian life we all want these moments of Holy Spirit what just happened right <clears throat> And I don't think that those risk moments ever happen unless we step out and go, hey, um, Lord just whispered in my ear to do this. And what would happen if I did this? And um, by the way, I love the Bill Johnson video, the Cornerstone video. Like, are you kidding me? Yeah. If you guys haven't listened, watched that, you know, dude, I was blown away yesterday by it. Like, um, you know, and I, I was telling my group, he's a little bit out of my camp, right? My, out of my tribe, but but, but that's okay yeah. because it was so solid, so well said. And he covered these this issue, right? Of what does it look like to take a risk? And like, if, if, if we serve a God where it has said to us, nothing is impossible for us, then why in the world aren't we like, camping out on that and and taking him at his word and praying impossible prayers and and taking impossible steps i mean i you know like and he, when he empowers it it doesn't feel like i'm doing you know the uh indiana jones thing it's like it's more like a paved highway and i go wait you've been here before me what's the you know what's happening here so uh, i know i know in our in our previous brigade one at our um, retreat, we had some of those moments over and over again where, you know, someone would share and then someone else had exactly the right thing to say. And just like he showed up faithful and, and really unlocked, used that 
that's those sessions to really help unlock us. But people had to take risks in order to get there. And it was really remarkable to see. So that's awesome. Okay. I love that, Paul. I'll share. Um, I feel like the hard part with risk is that we're so outcome focused. You know, if I do this, will it happen, turn out that way that I expect and I'm, my heart is so longing for? And I think for me, I'm trying to learn how to have my definition of success be tied to obedience to God out of love. And so I launched this art business after leaving my corporate career four years ago, which was a huge risk and felt like I was called to it. And I don't have the measurements of worldly success, but at the end of the day, I know I followed what God wanted. And if the last thing is my obedience and closer intimacy with him, which I really have gotten just tremendously, then that is success. You know what I mean? So I'm sitting in that right now and just processing it and, and loving him. Really beautiful, Erica. Thank you. Saw you on mute, Tracy. <laughs> you don't have to share if you don't want to. But I'm like, oh, I always love watching. I seen you on mute. I can tell. I'm like, ooh. Well, I can just say, like, there have been times that I've risked, and it's like, I feel like God will just be like, oh, you need to tell this person this, and I'm like, that's just crazy. I'm not going to do that um because it's just weird and um it's kind of one of those things that just takes time I think um and and a lot of people like in my family that would sound real crazy to them so one day I was at the car wash and this guy was like just washing his car like you know after he'd already gone through the car wash just doing all the things and you know the tires and he and I said, you know, and and I, I did. I just felt like God was like, you know, you need to tell me he's patient. And I'm like, well, that's just, no, I don't want to do that. And then I was like, no, you need to tell me he's patient. So I said, hey, you know, it sounds really weird. And I, but, you know, I feel like God just wants you to know that you're really patient. And he sees that. And he said, I just had a meeting with my mentors. I don't know if it was that day or the day before. And they would just tell me, they were like, brother, you just got to be patient. And he was like, I am not a patient person. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, all right, yeah. thanks, you know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then you just walk away because you're like, okay, but, you know, like he does. And I, and I do think, you know, and it, I do also feel like if we get it wrong, if, if we're like, if you say something to someone, they're like, I have no idea what that's about. I don't feel like when we get to heaven, he's going to be like, you screwed that one up. That was totally wrong. Um, well, so it was, well, it wasn't wrong if it was a prophetic uh, shot into his yeah. future and you were preaching yeah, exactly. what's going to happen, not what was <laughs> happening. So just, yeah. Yeah. It's a good word. But I mean, just, you know, it's not like we're going to get there. He's like, that wasn't, I wasn't meaning that. Like if you thought <laughs> that, but that wasn't it. I, I, like I'm not going to get in trouble. Um. But yeah, it was very ironic though. I thought it was uh, it was a little shocking. It was one of my first times that something like that had happened. And so, yeah. Fun. And the more we practice, it's like muscle. I heard a story one time of a girl who was at a gas station and she heard the Holy Spirit say, I want you to go in and do a handstand by the soda machine. And she is like, shut up. What? Like, first of all, in our flesh, we're never going to have that thought. Okay, like you can guarantee that's probably the Holy Spirit, right? Or, I, I mean, 
why would the devil anyway so she's like fine I'm all in I'm gonna do it so she did and the person at the counter if I remember correctly just be broke into tears because they had said god if you're real someone needs to come in here and do a handstand by the soda machine and I'll know you're real and like heaven came down they're in the gas station and so we we just get to follow and obey right like it may seem totally ludicrous to us he's patient okay lord you know but like who knows what the resonance of your obedience tracy will do in the next years of his life like that's so delightful i uh one more story and then <laughs> we could just talk all night y'all but we can't because that would be too long um our pastor he was sharing a story he very much operates in the prophetic and he's developed it over 40 years he like hears the lord blah 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 whatever nothing we can't learn um and he was a vacuum salesman at one season of his life and he went into a house and they, he was with his partner and they were selling this vacuum to this guy and the holy spirit said you need to ask him how he's been feeling recently because something's wrong and so he was like okay that's fine i will well then they got to chatting and he never did and he found out that the next day the man went on a trip and had a massive heart attack and died and so for him it was immense regret right because the lord had prompted him to ask this man how are you feeling for the purpose of having him like oh maybe you know what maybe i should get my heart checked you know there were there was more to the story but i think i would rather look like a fool in trying than not you know see isn't that yes oh that's fun michelle so let's let's be obedient right like Let's share and partner with the Holy Spirit in the world. All right. Um, would someone grab the declarations? I actually have. You got them, Dory? Yeah. I love it. Shake them. Shake them, baby. <laughs> I'm okay. ready. But what were you going to say? You know what? I changed my mind. I want you to read them first, and then I'll show okay. you. I have one more video clip to show you as we pray. Okay. I am a leader called and equipped to bring the gospel message to the world around me every day. I live as a worshiper, no other gods before him, God first and God only. I am a child of God. My identity is anchored in this truth and I live, love and lead from this reality. I am a lover of people. I will believe the best, be unoffendable, and look for the gold in people. I am a servant, first to my father, then to those around me. I delight in serving freely, knowing that I am a child of God. Because I am confident in my God and in my own identity, I will take risks. I will love others, dream big, and think the unthinkable. I will brave myself. I am a relentless freedom fighter. I will not give up. I will live free and fight for the freedom of others. Because joy is my inheritance, I will facilitate joy wherever I go. Because I am a child of God, because he has called me to lead and serve others, I will speak life. I am his mouthpiece and I will create life with my words wherever I go. I will never stop growing, learning, and hungering for Christ and more of him. My life is from him, by him, and for him. I will live for his glory and honor. Amen. Okay. I want you to watch this video. You should see these places. I mean, there's a whole world outside of books and maps. Do you want to? How? Every door is guarded. Who said anything about a door? What are you doing? Sometimes, princess. Sometimes you just have to take a risk. <gasps> Thank you. 
is this? A magic carpet? Do you trust me? What did you say? Do you trust me? Hmm. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Lord, we trust you. Would you move your body into some place of worship and surrender, whatever it looks like. You can stand up, you can sit down, you can kneel, you can stay in your chair, palms up, hands up, whatever it is for you to lift your soul, your body, your mind to this one who is so worthy. This darling, will you trust me? <laughs> Father, we trust you. You are good and you do good and there is none like you and you are worthy of all celebration. You're worthy of the times of suffering. Lord, you are worthy. And we once again give you our yes, that our lives would be poured out like the oil and the anointing fragrant perfume that Mary poured on your feet. May our lives be that, God. So we thank you for teaching us, for instructing us. God, would you deliver us from unbelief? God, we want to be believing believers to walk in all that you have for us. So we give you our yes. Mm. Mm. And this week, God, it going into freedom fighting, would you teach us? Would you expose any areas where we are not actually yet free that you want to give it to us? Lord, would you show us the places, the battles we are born for? And would you equip us in a new way this week, God? Thank you you're better than we know would you continue to give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of jesus we love you back lord in jesus name. Amen. Amen. all right next week is really the best it's freedom fighting y'all it's so good okay and we're going to do this thing called a self-assessment this week okay so in the self-assessment you do not have i need to rename it we're going to call it a Holy Spirit assessment because you're going to sit with him and ask what he thinks. Because what we think can be skewed, right? It can be skewed to, oh, I'm terrible or I'm actually killing it. And he'll be like, let me bring you back to where you are. You might be doing better in some area that you thought you were failing and you might need a little bit of poverty of spirit in another area. And so it is an invitation from the Lord to allow him space in your heart. This is leadership. This is allowing the Holy Spirit to give feedback. And I want to tell you, if there's something you're stuck on and you're like, I don't know. And I don't have a sense from the Lord. Ask the person who knows you best what they would rate you. Right. And then we, we hold it. Just, it's just like the personality test and the gifting test. It's just a tool that we allow the Holy Spirit to talk to us through. And it's really good. All right. Y'all have a fantastic week. See you next week, and if not before, in some other of the places. Go forth, beloveds. <laughs>